And the only way you can truly get your third axis set right is at full draw because of your cable guard. It's one thing we're shooting at a dot. For me, it's 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 infinitely more important taking the life of an animal and making sure I execute that correctly. Absolutely. So for those who don't know, there are some people that think that if you shoot uphill, your arrow will fall more than when you shoot downhill. Hmm. So explain that math to us real quick, Jimmy. <clears throat> well, it doesn't work. Hey everyone, this is Rod White, and you're either listening to or watching The Rod White Bow Show. Hey everyone, welcome to The Rod White Bow Show. I'm your host, Rod White, and tonight I've got on the phone Jimmy Butts, who's a three-time world champion. He's got a national championship. Uh, he's won Reading, which is a little bit of what we're, about what we're going to talk about. He's the first Lucky Dog winner at Vegas. He's been in multiple shoot-offs in Vegas and NFA Indoor Nationals. And uh, I think he's won several. And correct me if I'm wrong, we've won several. ASA, Cabela's, IBOs, kind of back in the day before, uh, well, just back in the day, we'll call it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks. Jimmy shoots for, uh, and I don't know if I'll get all these right, but he's uh, recently brought on the Botech staff. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, I'm just going to let you talk about the rest. Yeah, Botech, Shibuya, Gold Tip, um, uh, Bee Stinger. That's about it. And Infinite Archery. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you get paid well for that one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, one of the things I want to talk about since Reading's coming up, it's uh, just a few weeks away, and unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to go. I haven't seen my kiddos forever, and I'm on the struggle bus with getting trading weekends. But So I'm going to have to miss that one, or I'm just not going to see them for a long time, and I'm not going to do that. So painfully, I have to say I'm not going to be there. But I don't. are you going, Jimmy, this year? Oh, yeah, definitely. Awesome. Well, Jimmy, having won it before, if there's uh, a host of pros out there who know how to shoot up and down hills, which is a lot of redding, a little bit of wind, um, I thought one of the things we could talk about for people, and this affects obviously bow hunters as much as it does tournament shooters, whether you're going to redding or you're shooting the OPA event. Last year we had some angles at OPA, but nothing. I don't think I think redding's probably more severe for sure than I would say than OPA was last year. Yeah, quite a bit. So for those who don't know. There are some people that think that if you shoot uphill, your arrow will fall more than when you shoot downhill. Hmm. So explain that math to us real quick, Jimmy. <clears throat> well, it doesn't work. <laughs> uh, yeah, and in some cases, in, in the rare instance, uh, like, for instance, 80 yards uphill at 2 or 3 degrees, you have to shoot it for, like, 80.1 yards or something like that. But, it, you know, it, it, the higher the higher it gets, the more you actually take off. So 5 degrees, you might shoot it for, you know, I'm just, I'm just rattling off numbers, but at 5 degrees or 10 degrees, you might shoot it for 78, 78 yards. At, you know, 15 degrees, you'll shoot it for 75 yards. And then all of a sudden... If you start getting over 20 or 30 degrees, then, then things start to go back the other way. Um, so it, it doesn't, there, there's a little bit of math that you can do as long as the cuts aren't extreme, but it doesn't work for every distance for, and, and I know why, um, because if you're shooting horizontal to the ground, perfectly horizontal to the ground, then the math could start there. But we all know that shooting a bow at 20 yards, 30 yards, 40 yards, the further you get back away from the target, your angle increases from 2 to 3 to 4 to 5 degrees. So we're always calculating, regardless of the distance, we're always calculating from zero. But we don't start at zero ever unless technically we're shooting downhill, then we start at zero. So... I don't, know, I don't know if everybody follows me on that, but it, we don't start at zero when we shoot our bows, but we start at zero when we do our math. And that's why 
uh, you know, Perry came out with his program that was supposed to help with that and factor those things in. And it does to a degree. Perry's program works, you know, really good to a degree. Um, but then when you think, when you go overseas and you shoot things like, um, whales, where all of a sudden now you've got 30, 40, and 50 degree angles, <laughs> then it, it, it's a whole different game. So, it, uh, so roughly like, let's just say if you were shooting at Reading, for those who do shoot at Reading or will be shooting at Reading, what, what is our most severe angle there? Would, would you guess, or maybe, you know, off the top of your head, I think, uh, 20, 20 degrees, 20 24 degrees. It's been a couple of years since I've shot it, and you don't have many of those. I mean, Bigfoot's only like three or four degrees downhill. Um, and then after Bigfoot, you have the Bears, which are, I don't know, 15 degrees or something like that uphill at 57 yards. You don't have, you have a couple of bunnies um, uh, that are real, like butterflies and badgers and stuff like that, that are at pretty extreme angles, like 20, 24 degrees. But um, that's about it. I mean, you don't. Uh, you have a lot of up and hit, up and down hills, but they're not extreme. You still have to do your math and your calculations, but they're not outside of Perry's program. So Perry's program is a program called Archer's Advantage, for a lot of you who don't know. There's a bunch of programs out there. And last year on Facebook, you posted something that was pretty cool, and I jacked with and was obviously correct, was uh, you posted something about, for those of you who are putting in marks for the OPA and for various other shoots where we'll be shooting up and downhill, especially Redding. How, how does that, you had like a little tip on how to correct some slight variances because how that program works is you input some data and I think really only three seem to be relevant, but, or maybe it's four measurements, but you put in some data and you shoot and get a, what we call a hard mark at 20 yards and at seven yards, I guess some people call a hard mark, but meaning that you've, You've, you've shot those distances in, and on the side of your scale, if you have a movable sight tape, most of, or a movable sight, most of those, especially the higher end sights, have a scale on the side. And they go zero to 100, and wherever that number is, say at 20 yards for you, that might happen to be 30.6 on your scale, and when you get to 70 or 80 yards, it may be 74.2, I mean, just total random numbers. And that scale correlates, you punch those numbers in, and it kicks you out a sight tape, but those sight tapes, if you, when you generate them, could be off in the center, and you corrected with that with a super cool, simple tip. Yeah, what it is is when we measure from when we're measuring from our peak to our arrow, the arrow generally is going to be I don't know, let's just say twenty six to twenty eight inches long. If you were to move that point, just the point of the arrow up, let's say one or two millimeters, it would almost be undetectable at the point where you measured the peak to the arrow. So that's where the flaw is because it's not a precise measurement. So in order to make it a precise measurement, what I do is I get a perfect 20 and I get a perfect 100. And I get the 100 because that's the longest distance that you can put into Archer's Advantage. You can't go any further. And, and truth be told, you actually shoot Bigfoot for 100 yards anyway. So I don't, I don't worry about the 101. So I get a perfect 20 and a perfect 100. Then what I'll do is I'll walk up to three yards, which is the closest shot that you'll take at Reading. And it's very critical um, that you get that mark perfect. And what I'll do is I'll run the sight tape or the, I'll run the knob up until I shoot out the top. Then I'll run the knob down until I shoot out the bottom. Then I'll divide the two and find the medium because it, you can everybody knows that when you're that close you can really crank on your sight before you actually see movement in the arrow at that distance so that's why i'm trying to find an average to get a little bit better mark and what that does you can't put that mark into archer's advantage so what you do is you write that mark down you input your 20 you input your 100 it generates the numbers then you go into Archer's Advantage and you adjust your peep height up or down. Generally, it's up. Generally, I have to average almost a quarter of an inch more in Archer's Advantage in order to make it right. So I'll keep adjusting the peep height up until my 
written three mark matches the mark in Archer's Advantage. And every time you adjust your peep, you have to repopulate everything in Archer's Advantage. Then once you do that, it actually micro adjusts all your 50, you know, your mid ranges, like your 50s or something like that. Because if you're, if you'll, if some people, a lot of people will notice, they'll get a good 20, they'll get a good 80, but their 50s, it's just not right. It's just either a little high or a little low. Well, all of that can be corrected with the three yard mark. That's how I fix, that's how I adjust my peep height. And, and the average for me is right around, if I measure it at, let's say, a three and a half inch from peep to center of the shaft, I generally come out a quarter inch longer. So, you know, 3.75. Well, what's interesting to that it, or for that for me is, so this weekend, I got a program on my phone called Archer's Mark, which I thought, well, this is going to be pretty sweet because it's all on my phone. Uh, like a knucklehead, I went out there and shot and got my numbers mixed up by messing with my phone and listening to a couple other people spit out numbers and ADHD kicked in. And before I know it, I shot one target off the top, like as in missed the target and then barely caught the top of another target, like a knucklehead. And I was shooting pretty good. So I was bummed and fixed it the next day. But that program, Archer's Mark, is it, it was it's not the program's fault by any means. It was just that I my ability to pay attention to 14 things going on at once is not awesome. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that program actually, it, it kind of, it's a lot simpler than, than Perry's program with Archer's advantage in that you, you punch in the numbers and it, you seem like you don't have to put in all the other stuff there. I mean, you're not compensating for a lot of other factors that he asked you to put in there. But what was kind of interesting about this program is when I punch in my 20 and my 70, so, for example, I mean, I'm looking at it right now. My 20-yard mark is 40.6 on my hard number scale. And then when I, my other number that I got was 70 yards, which was 70.25. But in the middle, I still had that math error that didn't go away. So I made an adjustment actually at 40 yards, and I put in another mark of 50.95, and it just kind of averaged everything out. With the edit button? Yep. Yeah, it was... Mm -hmm. It's got a thing called, and it posts those new numbers on the mods. It says it's got a mark, a mod, and a cut, angle cut, which I'm not really sure how to use the angle cut. It doesn't spit it out, but that might be something they could punch in when you're at Reading to get those numbers. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it seemed to pretty much correct the, the flaws I had because, I mean, it sounds silly. I mean, it was only like an inch and a half difference at the target, but an inch and a half could mean a five on some targets almost. Especially in up and down hill situations. Yeah, which we don't when, have at ASA, but... <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> but out of the other terms, we definitely do. Yeah, Archer's Mark works the same way. I really like Archer's Mark because it, it's, it's, it seems to be, at the beginning, a little bit more accurate than Archer's Advantage. But it also has that function in there where you get to your mid marks and they don't match, there's an edit button in there and you can put in your actual shot in marks and then press the button shot in and then hit update. And every, from that mark down, it will adjust everything. Yeah. And then if you go into Archer's Mark and you adjust your peep height and leave just your two marks, like your 20 and your 80, it will do the same thing. It will correct your three yard mark and and it'll make those middle ranges a little bit more precise. So w the program or the formula, I'm guessing these are probably all the same as essentially what you're saying is even with Archer's Mark or any other program out there, you're probably going to have to make that fine-tuned adjustment you mentioned earlier. It is, because you're measuring too close to the knock of the arrow. If you were measuring out, let's say, in the middle of the arrow or closer to the end of it from your peep, it was if it was physically possible to do that, measuring from the peep to the point of your arrow especially you know depending on how long it was you'd probably get a better measurement but you're measuring so close to the knock so the pivot point um, on that arrow which would be directly below your peep it moves so much less than the tip of your arrow so if you move your tip your arrow, let's just say one inch, it may only move one millimeter at the peak, but it may, it makes a huge difference. And that's, that's where that little tiny flaw is. It's not that the program is, it's not that the math is wrong. 
It's just that how we measure is wrong. Gotcha. Well, or, or it's not as accurate. It's, it's harder to measure that difference. It is. Yeah. So for those guys who are out there who are in gals who are ranging in there that who may be shooting up and down some hills, maybe over in Pennsylvania or wherever, not even shooting these big events, more importantly, bow hunters, there are angle compensators built in the laser range finders. And you use or have used or told me about using um, what some people look at you probably and be like, what the flip? That's what is that? It's a it's a Sunto, which is like kind of like my watch, I believe, same company. Can't imagine mm-hmm. it's called Sunto, but um, it, it's an incl- inclinometer. Is that right? Yes. So when you walk up to a target, and and you probably have these from over the years, I imagine. Maybe you don't even have to do this anymore. But when you walk up to a target, and like say for the year you won writing, you you knew the distance as a measured distance from the stake. I don't, did they? I don't know if they were using the laser range finder then or not. But if you clicked on it with a laser range finder, it may say, say it's a, an 80 yard target, just throw out a random number. And you lasered it, and it says you should shoot it for whatever the distance may be, 78. It's going to read that number 78 and show you an angle. How precise do you think that is? Like if you're shooting like you are for the weekend for tens of thousands of dollars, potentially, how, which would you just say close enough? Or would you? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I knew that was coming. Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. I mean, the, the laser range finders are based off of straightening. And they say, hey, oh, there's an archery, you know, there's an archery side of it. Um, you know, you can click on that archery button so that you can do your up and down hills. But it's still, I mean, it, you know, it's close enough for general work, let's say for your hunting or something like that. But when you start making cuts up and down hills at 20 or 30 degrees at 40, 50 yards, I mean, you know how precise you got to be at that. And so, no, no, I, I would much rather do the math. You know, I, I know, um, and I, I, you know, people laugh, I carry around a palm pilot with, with, I probably have the only AA palm left in existence, but, uh, I, I will do, I will get the actual angle from a Sunto and put the math into the program and, and get that mark. And the, like I said, the only time that that doesn't work is when you're shooting extreme angles. And I'm talking like 12, 15 yards at 50 degrees downhill or uphill. Um, you know, outside of that, I, I've tried, you know, I've got those high end range finders and I've used them. But the problem is, like I said earlier, is that they're measuring from zero and you're, if you're shooting at a target 80 yards away, perfectly flat, horizontal from you, you are holding at five degrees above that target to hit it. So you're not starting from zero. That's why the programs don't necessarily work all that well. Because you're changing that arc as you change distance. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, technically, five degrees downhill at 80 yards is flat because you're starting perfectly horizontal to the ground in order to hit the target downhill. But 80 yards flat, you're starting at five degrees above. And then, you know, it just keeps going from there. 80, you know, 80 yards, five degrees up, you're actually starting at 10 degrees, holding at 10 degrees. So, no, I, uh, I prefer to do the math. <laughs> it's just worked out better for me. So Jimmy will be at Reading selling those for five dollars a sheet, unless you're in the men's <laughs> pro division, in which yeah. it would be ten thousand dollars per sheet. <laughs> actually, I think uh, the the guys have put out like some cut charts for them, and they actually the cut charts actually went off of Perry's program previously, and they're they're pretty spot on. They're um. Those those cut charts that they sell there at Reading are pretty good. Well, it's a um, interesting thing I'm sure for a lot of you that are listening, especially man bow hunters. If we haven't lost all of them at this point, <laughs> it's extremely important when you're hunting animals like mealies out west, or if you hunt high country stuff like I do a lot for elk. I'm, I at times I'm shooting some really steep angles, steeper than for sure than I shoot at Reading, and sometimes it's really close. So it's a very relevant topic and. If, I guess if you're a little bit lost in that, um, you can certainly message me. I'll do my best to answer them a little 
Um, I certainly not a whiz at it like Jimmy is. Basically, I want to shoot and make sure that that arrow kills that animal I'm shooting at, and that's kind of my gig. So <laughs> I'm using the laser rangefinder most of the time. But at Reading, certainly a cut chart would maybe would have saved me some points last year. You know. Yeah, and when you're when you're hunting those animals, and, and and if you don't have time to sit there and do the math, and you don't have time to sit there and punch in the angles and the distance into an AA palm, I know you know it, hunting animals is no different than shooting target. It takes practice, and the animal deserves the respect of you putting in the practice. So on the side of my range find here. In 10-yard increments, I will put down 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, you know, uh, degree cuts. And so I'll say, let's just say the animal is 30 degrees above me or 30 degrees below me at 40 yards. It'll tell me right away what distance I need to shoot it for. So well, it's it's close enough to hit a heart, maybe not close enough to hit an X, but, uh, you know. Good enough for the girls we date. That's right. That's exactly right. <laughs> The, uh, um, when I'm out west too, uh, uh, another thing I'll do, and it's, again, it's very rough, um, but I will take, there's an, actually your phone can supposedly do that, and I, I've used it before, and it seems pretty close, but who knows, I mean, shooting animals, they move, and um, lots of different factors going in there, but you can use, there's an inclinometer built into your phone somehow, I guess. Yep. Um, yeah, I have it, yeah. Use that, and so, I, that, again, that'll get you close enough if you're shooting at, you know, a very, very steep uphill or downhill shot at a muley who's in its bed you've got lots of time you can check the trajectory and then that chart i can put um i put on my upper limb just so i double check it to know that i've got it there because i'm not doing any math most of the time when i'm sitting there waiting for an opportunity i'm thinking more about what ifs than anything else so mm -hmm. that's another thing you can do and and the second day this year well this past weekend at Paris, I shot a good score second and it was like third up on the range, but I had my chart on my stabilizer where I always keep it at. And the first day I didn't, I went to that phone app and there's something to be said for that little bit of routine that you're in all the time because holy cow, it cost me a lot of money this weekend for sure. Mm -hmm. But it can cost you a lot of money in a hunt as well if you're drawing a, a lifetime tag and or you've paid for a lifetime tag kind of thing. It can be very expensive making a simple mistake because you didn't. Judge yeah. the angle properly. Practice. Practice for everything. So, back to the tournament guys who are shooting writing in the OPA. Mm -hmm. OPA is interesting because it's it's a new... I learned a lot about what I wanted to do last year after I, I misset my sight again um, three times in my life, and I just mentioned all three of them. <laughs> Hashtag winning um, or losing. So, uh, the OPA is a little bit different in that... You're shooting at you are shooting at Mark Goss, just like Redding, but you're shooting at um, 3D foam animals, which really doesn't make a difference at all. And then they're a little bit rounded, but some folks go to shooting without a lens, and because they shoot the regular ASA stuff without a lens, I should say different than Redding. Excuse me. The, the OPA event, you're shooting at targets out to a distance. I forget, is it 80 yards? Maybe it goes further than that, doesn't it? Yeah, so a little much. bit. I think I think they had them out to 80, 85 yards, 83 yards, something like that. So on day two last year, I think it was, I was, well, I know it was, I was, it was super foggy, rainy, nasty conditions. And I decided to take my lens out because at times I couldn't even range the target because the rangefinder wouldn't work through the fog. And I took my lens out and then I shot, <laughs> it was like a 78 yard deer, I think it was. And my pin was bigger than the deer. So... If you're going to Reading, it, it may be helpful, and if you're not shooting in the Bullhunter Division, it may be helpful to know a little bit about, if 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 you're going to shoot in an open class, you probably should be shooting a scope system. And by scope system, I mean you should be shooting a lens probably on the front, and maybe a clarifier, maybe you're not. What what would you get, uh, give as a recommendation for those going out there for the first time? What kind of a peep lens combination would you use? Well, for Reading, you're shooting big orange dots, so you can just shoot a stick on black dot and you know you can shoot four six power seven power doesn't really matter the dots are quite a bit bigger a lot bigger than they are in opa with opa you have to be a little bit more precise you know i shoot i think last year i shot a seven power for opa because you're shooting at either a pink or an orange dot it's a lot smaller um like you mentioned on the second day the weather was terrible it was raining it was foggy so i just brought along one of those uh 
child nose suckers and just blew air, you know, blew air in the peat and blew air on the scope in order to get things cleared up. Uh, because you are shooting at a really small dot at a really long distance. I mean, OPA was stretched out, you know, average shot. I don't know what is 40, 50 yards at dots that were, you know, the size of coffee cups or smaller. So, um, you know, and it's, so ready and I would probably go a little bit more power, a smaller fiber optic pin, like 10 thousandths. Um, I probably would not recommend a clarifier unless you absolutely have to have one. Luckily, I don't have to have one. But Redding, I don't shoot it any different than I would a field round, a field round or an indoor archery round because you're shooting at a, a, a orange dot that is relative to the size of a field dot on a field archery range at so, that distance. So like 98% of people listening probably have no idea what, maybe know what field archery is, but have no idea what you're talking about there. Yeah, it's just a, a dot on a paper face, you know. So you're talking about, uh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what the centers are, but uh, if you're shooting on like a 60 or 50 centimeter face, the, you know, the dots are the, the dots are relatively big. So I, I'm guessing anywhere from from three yards out to 15 yards, the dots might be about the size of a silver dollar. And then the dots from 15 yards out to 35 yards might be the size of a coffee cup. And then out to, I think, 55 yards, they're the size of uh, like a coffee can. And then out past that, they get just a little bit bigger. But in OPA, your dots are the size of the 12 ring or the 14 ring, regardless of how far away it is. So it's a much, it's a much more precise game. Well, and for certain, last year was a great opportunity for those who are shooting the pro class to, I would say, do better than they will probably this upcoming year and the next year because guys were new to it. So I'm hoping the you know the hundred amateurs that are going to shoot this year that are new, I think it's a hundred amateurs they're going to let in, are going to uh, be able to learn a little bit from this podcast for sure because it it's not the same thing as shooting. An, an ASA or an IBO tournament, there there are hills involved, lots of them, and your bubble has to be level, and your sight has to be level, your third axis has to be level. Oh, yeah. Real quick, yeah. what uh, explain that to people, like first, second, and third axis of a sight. It's, it's imperative, especially when you're shooting OPA because you're shooting at such a smaller target. So the way that I set my third axis up is I took a long dowel rod. It's like the, the length of my arrow, let's say 26 and a half inches long or whatever my draw length is. And I screwed in a U-bolt in the end of it. And then I, I wrapped it with wire so it wouldn't split out. And then I cut a little notch in the other end of it. And so the very first thing I do is I put it in my medicine stone. And I, and I, I make sure that my shooting string, not the riser, but the shooting string is is is. Medicine stone meaning what? Medicine stone is a is a device that holds the bow, uh, in position. Is so you a, don't. Is it affordable for a guy to pick up on his own? If he's yeah, going out for, yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, I, there are other versions of it, but yeah, I don't know. I think it was one hundred ninety nine dollars or whatever it is. It's it's not terribly expensive, but it screws into the stabilizer hole of your bow, and then it's got a rod that's friction fitted into a uh, vertical post. And so you, you slide the bow into this medicine stone and you level the string uh, vertically looking from behind the bow and looking at the side of the bow. So you have this little device that spins around the string and you make sure that the bow is vertical uh, level in every direction. And then when, once you have your string vertical uh, to front and back, side to side, then what you'll do is you'll level your scope. And then once your scope is leveled, then what I do is I draw the bow back and into this dowel rod. And the only way you can truly get your third axis set right is at full draw because of your cable guard. Uh, the cable guard puts pressure on the side of it, twists the bow. If you're right-handed, it, puts, it twists the bow to the left, and then it moves your scope to the right. So the only way you can get your third axis set perfectly correct is if the bow is at full draw. So in the medicine stone, I can pull it back, 
put it in this jig, and then there's a way that you can twist the handle and rotate the bow completely forward or completely backwards. So I tip the bow over at, let's say, 45 degree angle, and then I'll look at the scope. And then I'll adjust the third axis on the scope until the bubble is in the center, and then I'll lean the bow all the way back at 45 degrees and see if it matches. Then I'll let it, I'll let it down. I'll take the, the dowel rod out of it uh, uh, and, and let the bow in the starting position, and I'll check to make sure that it's still level. Um, because when you're shooting things, especially like OPA, when you're shooting such a small target, let's say, let's say that the target is five degrees downhill, 50 yards, but you're standing on a side hill and you're not watching your bubble. You know, it's, it wouldn't, even if you got the yardage right and you weren't watching your bubble, you could be inches out to the left or right. So it is imperative that your third axis be spot on. And like I said, the only way to do that correctly is to have it at full draw in a device. It is ultra critical to me from a, a hunting perspective that that be as accurate as possible as well. And, and most sites don't have that adjustability. There's a few out there on the market. I'll try to look those up for you um, and get them posted in the show notes. But the one, it's one thing to, um, you know, kind of, okay, well, my range finder is close enough. You're talking about a massive, we probably should talk about it first because it is that important, at least from what I've seen, it's that important that everything is completely level. Um, it's crucial to, to ethically go out there and chase animals at longer distances and uh, somewhat at even are even closer distances. You can get really messed up on a side hill, especially if you're hunting around tag alders and things like that that are coming up the side of the hill. The old school way of doing it was, hey, just kind of level your bow against a tree. Well, like you should look at a tree and see the image <laughs> of the tree and line it up with your riser and that's good enough. It's, it's, it's not, <laughs> not when you're shooting no. longer distances. Yeah, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, hopefully a lot of that information was super helpful. We're about a, a half an hour. So we're going to kind of try to get this wrapped up, but, uh, Jimmy, you'll be headed to the ASA and, um, in Louisiana right now, I know, and we haven't talked for a while, so this is completely raw, but you, you were doing some coaching down there, and you had some other things going on, and whatever you can tell us, I guess. Um, what, what you got cooking down there besides the heat? Yeah, are we trying to get a little something going in Baton Rouge? In North Louisiana, they have a really strong Joe Ed program, and they have really strong archery in northern Louisiana, but that's three and a half, four hours away. So we were trying to get something going here in Baton Rouge. Um, so it's surprising how big Baton Rouge is in the sportsman's paradise, and there's such a limited availability for, you know, uh, uh, recreational archery. So, yeah, we're trying to get something going down here where, you know, get a little Joe Ad program going. Unfortunately, in the flood that we had a couple months back, we lost our only outdoor range, and it was owned by uh, wildlife and fisheries and it's not looking like the park is going to reopen anytime soon and even if it does we're not 100 percent guaranteed that we're going to get our range back so that's that's a little bit sad but you know it's it's slow going but it's coming together we're getting a you know possibly you know possibly if everything goes well we're going to get a training facility here in the next few months uh so you know fingers crossed and we'll see what we can do well, I know you moving down there, um, I know it's been a few struggles here and there, but you moving down there has been a big I, blessing, I guess you'd say. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of weird twists of events that have gotten you down there. I know your family's down there, but it's a big deal to the folks that are around there who are wanting to shoot target archery. And uh, I'm pretty sure, I'm like 99% sure that I trained Louisiana, uh, the state for the National Archery and Schools Program. So there's kids that are coming up there. And there are a lot of people who are wanting to experience archery. It is the sportsman's paradise, as they say on the back of the license plate. That's your kind of state motto, I think. Mm -hmm. But, um, it, you know, Jimmy's a great resource for down there. For any of you looking for, are, are you doing individual lessons at all or coaching or no? Yeah, I do occasionally. Um, you know, I, I'll bump into people that I shoot tournaments with around here, and they'll come over. Maybe they're having an issue with tuning or shooting. As a matter of fact, uh, some guy we uh, a lot of us may know. I think his name is Sylvester. Uh, he lives in, um, 
I might have his name wrong. He might be Cooper. I can't remember. <laughs> but he is a professional shooter. He's actually shooting a lot of the NAAs. He lives in New Orleans. He works for – he's in the military. And he just contacted me this weekend and said, yeah, you know, I really want to help. You know, can, you, can I come up there and shoot with you for some NAA and get some pointers and whatnot? He just got done shooting Arizona Cup. So it's it's picking up around here. So, um, so yeah, I, I occasionally get some people who just want to come out and shoot people who want some lessons i've had a few parents call me up and say that they want to get their kids involved and so that's great you know it's um it's slow going but i think it's going to be great well jimmy's uh one of my closest friends and he's certainly been a wealth of information as you can tell because probably a lot of you your brains are completely fried after listening to all that information but <laughs> it's all uh for you to go out and learn that on your own, it's been years, obviously, of Jimmy kind of collecting that information to be able to, to share it with us. And so uh, all of us who are listening, including myself, appreciate that information as always. Uh, Jimmy is, uh, when I when I have an issue with something, he is a big resource for me to turn to and talk to. And I regularly do that. I, I mean, I feel like I know quite a bit about archery, but I always revert to others who have had extreme success and credentials are something that Jimmy certainly has. So if you're looking for some help down south, Jimmy's a great, great resource, and he travels to some of these bigger shoots. And um, man, three-time world champion in your own backyard down there. So you take advantage of it. So thanks for being on the show, Jimmy. And I'm uh, Jack to see you again. I don't know when that'll be. I wish it was Reading, but uh, maybe another ASA or something coming up soon. Or or pig hunting. <laughs> <laughs> True story. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> we were driving down last weekend i was riding with adam gibson and there's a, uh, i don't know if that'll which order all this old air in but uh we saw a giant pig and i saw one just roll out of that truck and launch an arrow <laughs> <laughs> but there was yep. a state trooper right behind us <laughs> yep. nah that doesn't stop me it's highly <laughs> illegal kids don't do that at home and that's right easy archery talk it was a joke so <laughs> Anyways, if you uh, need some information, like I said, Jimmy's did look it up at. And we'll talk to you later. Peace out. Thanks so much for tuning in to the Rod White Bow Show. To help me keep more content like this coming, I would be super appreciative if you could subscribe, like, and share this episode on your own favorite social media platforms. And as always, feel free to make comments in the section below. By commenting, you're not only giving me more direction about the information that you want me to deliver to you in the future, but you're also helping me reach more people just like us. And as a thank you for your support, the first 50 people that sign up after the show for my new online course, 60 Day Elk Training, will receive a free extinguisher game call valued at $29.99 with an instructional DVD where I walk you through how to communicate with mature whitetails and bring them tight into bow range. Thanks again for tuning in.